How long after swallowing a pill does it take for a drug to enter your bloodstream? How long does it take for hot molten glass to cool? In this video, we'll see how the gradient helps us model molecular and thermal diffusion. This video is part of the Differential Equations video series. Laws that govern a system's properties can be modeled using differential equations. Hi, my name is Tom Peacock, and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering here at MIT. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the gradient. Partial differential equations describe the world around us. And partial differential equations often contain grad, div, and or curl terms. In order to use these operations to describe physical phenomena, the first step is to understand what each mathematical process means geometrically and how it behaves in different examples. The gradient is an operation that takes in a scalar function and outputs a vector field. Many scalar quantities, such as temperature and density, have time derivatives that exhibit both a magnitude and a direction. Therefore, it makes sense that we would need an operation that turns scalar functions into vector fields. Before watching this video, you should be familiar with the definition of the gradient and its connection to the directional derivative. After watching this video, you will be able to recognize that the gradient vector points in the direction of the maximum slope of a scalar function and has magnitude equal to that slope, describe the physicality of Fick's first law as it applies to concentration gradients. Imagine what happens when you swallow a pill. Usually the pill contains an active ingredient, or drug, and a mixture of other inactive ingredients such as binders, flavoring agents, etc. Some pills are coated to make the pill easier to swallow and to control the release of the drug. When you swallow the pill, it starts to dissolve. It is usually desired for there to be a constant and predictable delivery rate of drug to the body. That is, that the diffusion of the drug reaches a steady state. We need to understand what this steady state amount is to ensure that we are delivering the desired dose. The equation that describes diffusion is the partial derivative of c with respect to time is equal to d del squared c, where c is concentration and d is the diffusion coefficient, which we will assume is a constant. But where does this come from? In order to understand this completely, we will need to combine the divergence and gradient to have a full description of the del squared term. In this video, our goal is to understand how flux is related to the gradient of the concentration. Let's review the properties and meaning of the gradient. The gradient is a local property of a function. That is, it depends only on points that are near a point of interest. Given a function of two variables, f of x and y, we can represent this function as a surface in three dimensions, z equals f of x and y, or as a collection of level curves. The gradient at a point x, y can be determined by finding a vector in the tangent plane to z equals f of x, y at x, y that points in the direction of the steepest slope. The gradient vector is a vector in the x, y plane. The direction is found by projecting the vector in the tangent plane down onto the xy plane. The magnitude of the gradient is the slope of that vector in the tangent plane. This vector is always perpendicular to the level curve because along the level curve the function is constant. What is the one-dimensional analog of the gradient? Take the tangent line to the graph of the function. Point a vector up the hill, then project down. The direction is either positive or negative. The magnitude is the slope of the graph. But one-dimensional vectors are scalars, so the gradient is simply the derivative. And we already know that the derivative is a local property of a function because it is a limit. It depends only on points in a small region near the point at which we are looking for the derivative. What happens in three dimensions? 
it's somewhat difficult to represent a three-dimensional function. The best way to represent such a function is through a collection of level surfaces. The gradient field can be computed at every point on the level surface. We know that the gradient vector is a three-dimensional vector that is normal to the surface. The magnitude of the gradient vector measures the steepest increase of a shape we can't imagine, though, because it's four-dimensional. In order to better understand this process, we begin with a demo. Here you see water and a drop of dye. Initially, the dye is concentrated in a single droplet at the center. Over time, the dye particles move away from the center until a point in time when the process reaches a steady state. In order to model what is happening at the atomic level in this demo, we're going to start by making a one-dimensional discrete model. This one-dimensional model will be simpler, and it will allow us to describe the flux of particles more easily. Then, we will extend the model to two dimensions, creating a discrete time-step simulation to determine the equation for flux. Then, we will look at the three-dimensional equation for flux. In the one-dimensional model, we're going to model the particles of dye as random walkers on a line. Each random walker has an equal probability of moving one step of length delta x to the right or to the left during a time step delta t. The walkers move independently of each other. We make an assumption that delta x and delta t are both small. In order to understand how the particles are moving, we want to understand the flux through any given point. Recall that flux is flow per unit area per unit time. Our random warp model is one dimensional, so we will define the flow of particles through a single point over a time step delta t to be flux. While we can look at the flux through any point, for mathematical convenience, let us determine the flux through the point x plus delta x over 2 at time t. This point is halfway between the point x and x plus delta x. Because of the hypotheses of our random walk, any particle that is within a step length delta x to the left or the right of x plus delta x over 2 has a probability of flowing through the point during the next time step. So in order to find the flux, the first step is to determine how many particles are within our step distance delta x from the point x plus delta x over 2. Let the concentration of particles be denoted by the function c of x and t, which is the number of particles per unit length at a time t. To find the number of particles to the left of x plus delta x over 2, we could integrate the concentration function over the interval of length delta x centered about the point x. However, because we have assumed that delta x is small, we can approximate the concentration function by the value of the concentration at x for the whole interval. So the number of particles on the interval of length delta x centered about the point x can be approximated by c of x and t times delta x. The number of particles on the interval of length delta x centered about the point x plus delta x is approximately c of x plus delta x and t times delta x particles. We assume that any particle has 50% probability of moving one step to the left or the right. Thus, the flux through our point is given by one half times the number of particles to the left minus one half times the number of particles to the right at time t. We divide the entire expression by the time step, which is the unit of time over which we are looking at the motion of the particles. To dig a little deeper into this equation, we can take a Taylor expansion of our concentration function, c of x plus delta x and t, about x, while holding t fixed. This gives us the following expression, which is a polynomial in delta x with coefficients given by multiples of sequentially higher partial derivatives of the concentration function c. 
our equation for flux becomes this seemingly more complicated equation. However, if we recall that delta x is very small, the quadratic term in this equation will dominate, and we can ignore the higher order terms. This simplifies the expression for flux to the following. Because delta x and delta t are both small, this implies that delta x grows proportionally to square root of delta t. You can do a tabletop experiment by placing a small drop of dye in a narrow test tube and measuring the change in height of dye with respect to the change in time in order to verify that the assumption we have made is valid. Rewriting the constant term in front as some diffusion constant d, this equation is commonly written as a flux is equal to negative d times the partial derivative of c with respect to x. The negative sign in this equation says that the direction of net flux goes from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration, in the opposite direction as the concentration gradient. Why is this? If there are more particles on one side of a point than the other, we suspect half of them flow through the point on either side. So the net flow through the point is away from the highest concentration. Now we want to extend this to two dimensions. Here we have modeled a system of 2,000 particles walking randomly in the plane. Each particle can move a unit distance away from its current location in any direction with equal probability. A profile of the concentration at each time step is displayed to the right. We change the view of the concentration to be contour lines and add some more particles to increase the accuracy of our computation in order to add in the flux vector. In 2D, the flux is a flow per length per unit time and is a vector quantity. Observe that the flux is everywhere perpendicular to the level sets or contours of the concentration map and it points away from the highest concentration. In other words, this simulation suggests that the flux points in the direction of the negative gradient of the concentration. This behavior is consistent with what we saw with the dye the equation that describes this says that the flux j is equal to some constant, which we'll call d, times the negative gradient of the concentration. Compare this to the equation we had in the one-dimensional example. Here, the derivative is replaced by the gradient, because the derivative is the one-dimensional analog of the gradient. This equation is one form of Fick's first law. It says that flux points along the negative gradient of the concentration. It turns out that this equation describes the flux of many familiar quantities. Let's consider some examples. This is a demonstration of solid state diffusion. The 30 people here represent two types of atoms in our two-dimensional depiction of two different crystalline solids, pink and gray. The blue line represents the interface between the two solids. Because the solids are crystalline, the atoms occupy positions on a lattice. In our lattice, as in all real crystalline materials, not all lattice sites are occupied. A fraction of the lattice sites, dictated by thermodynamics, are vacant. Here we have 6 vacancies and 30 atoms. If we ignore boundary effects and assume that the vacancies are randomly distributed, then there is an equal probability that a vacancy is in front behind, to the right, or to the left of an atom. In some crystalline materials, vacancy diffusion is the operative mechanism for solid state diffusion. In others, it's interstitial diffusion. Here we are demonstrating the mixing of disparate atoms in the solid state via vacancy diffusion. Each atom can move randomly into an empty space on the lattice. Over time, the atoms diffuse. Pink atoms move from areas of high to low concentration, Gray atoms also move from areas of high to low concentration. This creates solid material mixing. The second law of thermodynamics says that heat flows from high to low temperatures. 
This means that the heat flux is proportional, perhaps non-uniformly, to the negative temperature gradient. This tells us that every time the glass is taken out of the furnace, it begins cooling down due to the temperature of the ambient air. Glass blowers must constantly return the glass to the furnace during the forming and shaping process in order to combat the constant cooling of heat energy flowing from the high temperature object, the glass, into the cooler space, the air. Here you see a small piece of space shuttle tile designed by Lockheed Missiles and Space Company to protect NASA's space shuttles from the high surface temperatures produced upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. When we heat the black side of the tile with a blowtorch, we can see that the area of the tile in contact with the flame reaches a temperature of approximately 800 degrees Celsius. We know this because it's glowing bright orange. However, the thermocouple reading on the opposite surface of the tile is only 22 degrees Celsius, just slightly above the ambient room temperature. The temperature gradient in the tile is therefore very large. There is a heat flux through the tile opposite in direction to the very large temperature gradient but the flux is so small that the tile barely feels warm to the touch. Be aware that this is just one form of Fick's first law. The most general form says that flux is proportional to the negative gradient of the chemical potential. You may see the equation in this form in later courses. In all the examples that we have considered in this video, the gradient of the concentration and the gradient of the chemical potential pointed in the same direction. To review, the gradient is a vector quantity that points in the direction of the maximum slope of a scalar function. Fick's first law says that flux points along the negative gradient of the concentration. In order to understand Fick's first law, we first considered models in 1D and 2D before trying to understand the description in 3D.